you hear me now? Did, yeah. Well, it happens. Well, good to see everybody. Good to see Kenneth and June back home. And happy anniversary. How many years? 49. 49. Yep. Soon I've been married 49. If we'll make it to 50, she doesn't kill me by then. So. All right, good to see everybody. Uh, didn't see our folks from Tennessee. Um, I want to continue to remember everyone on our prayer list. Rhonda Burtnett, Arnold. Arnold's here. How you feeling, Arnold? Good? Okay. Sue Wheeler, Jerry Della Hill, Bill and Bonnie Wright. Uh, Vaughn and Marshall Underwood, Lucille Watkins, uh, Maria Martin, Scott Shifford, and I spell Scott with an H. <laughs> but anyway, um, Johnny Griffin, Dawn Cooley, Greg Griffin, May Smith. She celebrated her 97th, 97th birthday on, on Halloween night or Halloween night. I see. <laughs> there, <laughs> there always has to be a witch. So, 115. Somebody on TV. Hmm. Okay. Uh, also, Nancy Marshall, Connie, Stacy, Aurelia Rogers, Bertha Infinger. Any update on Bertha? Is she doing any better? Okay, well that's good. <clears throat> also, Juanita Griffin, Juanita Chanel, Tina Carroll, Sherry Fort, Demar Elam, also Judd Sessions, Eddie Partain. Uh, Eddie, word on Eddie, is he about the same? Uh, Talitha? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Sandra Misseldine, I haven't seen anything or heard anything about her. Okay. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Donnie Turner. Uh, Turner. Um, Elaine sent me a text at Reddit, but basically he's doing much better. That's good. Travis Dean is home. Uh, recovering from surgery, and uh, they asked no visitors. I guess they're trying to keep infection down. Uh, but uh, don't know any more details than that, but keep Travis in your prayers. Also, Amanda Underwood, uh, she's home, and she is scheduled for surgery on the 29th of December. So keep her in your prayers. What about Cheryl? Okay. Okay. And uh, Aubrey probably has the flu again. So I didn't know you could get it twice in the same year, much less in the, a month's time. But it's really going around the school. It, it, I read that 75% of the people that have the flu are the kids, and it's in the schools. So uh, it's con very contagious. So anyway, um, hopefully everybody is uh, doing well. Seems like I've missed some missed somebody. Somebody we need to mention. Yeah, Alaire.
Stanley Freeman. And uh, if you didn't know, uh, Stanley Ryan, his wife passed away. Patty. Yeah, Patty. Uh, she had had cancer, is that right? I don't know what all she was going through. But anyway, I think it was like week four last, or last week, but anyway, I uh, always thought a lot of, of Stanley. Uh, he was at uh, Nettleton Church of Christ, just in, out, outside of South Haven, Mississippi, when I was at Memphis. And anyway, he held a, he was over in Jay, Florida when I moved here, and he held a meeting for us. And I, I'll tell you this, Stanley did more uh, to get out and to visit and to, to see people than any other preacher that we have had. Uh, yeah, he came here. He held a meeting here. Did a good job uh, and, and got out and we visited a lot of people. And, uh, but anyway, Patty, she passed away last week. So sorry to uh, make that announcement, but uh, anyway. Anybody else that we need to mention? We're going to update photos if you want your photo updated. Uh, we've got a lot that the kids were like this three years ago, and now they're up like this. So you wouldn't recognize them. So we need to get their pictures made, and there's a few others. We'll get you another one. Okay. We sure can. We've done this. Uh, I've learned Photoshop so I can make you look like Elvis <laughs> or Tom Cruise, and I haven't been able to work on the women yet, so <laughs> I'm kidding. You take Elvis. <laughs> you know, I've always said, you know, Elvis is never going to die. Ne somebody's got a dog named Elvis, or they name your kid Elvis or something. Anybody else? Brother Sewell, lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us throughout the periods of time that have already passed and for this present day, for the blessings that we've received because of the beauty of it for the opportunity that you've granted to us through a, the condition of our health to be able to assemble here together to have fellowship and to study your holy word together. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for Jesus, for the great sacrifice he paid on the cross of Calvary to all mankind. And we're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the blood he shed that purchased the church established his own body of the church and we're thankful that we are able to be members of it and to study your word together this evening and to become better servants in his kingdom, the church. We pray your blessings, Heavenly Father, upon those that are not as fortunate as we, that those that are suffering various Ill illnesses and ailments and other problems that have beset them in this life we pray your blessings will be extended unto each of them and those that are providing care and treatment for them, that the things that they do will be administered in a timely and effective way, that the results will benefit them and the progress that they are making for a full and complete recovery. We pray your blessings upon this uh, nation for all of those that are doing what they describe as a way to lead. We only ask, Heavenly Father, that you bless them where they deserve it and that they will only have hindrance in those things that are not according to your word. That we would always do good unto them. All those that do things that are contrary to your word, that we would still do what your scriptures teach us to do and that is to return good for evil. We pray that we'll always remember that all the things that are contained in your holy word that will be found faithfully adhering to each and every mandate that you have written in your holy scripture and that we will be uh, bringing glory unto you for the, all the things that we say and do. We pray your blessings.
blessings will continue to rest upon us and all those that are members of our congregation here. We pray you and thankful for our Heavenly Father for all those things that you've done to us. And we utter this prayer to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. See this thing right here? Microphone. So Mike's got it pretty much figured out. We were having problems people hearing people online so that picks up uh, pretty it's velcro you got to take it off you have to charge it recharge it is that right Roger I got the thumbs up so anyway but it, it, what happens is that if we're talking and somebody in the back talks then the people online can't hear that so there may be a minute worth of silence we hope that's got it fixed. Uh, you've seen the side mics, these mics, they're there for a reason. Uh, the ones hanging, uh, they, they help, but this mic is really, well, still mic. I still wear this one, Go, And that one, uh, they can turn this one off and turn that one on or vice versa or turn them both up. So, uh, you know, we, we've really, just to say this, that we have really, uh, I think, in my opinion, got a very professional quality of sound and video, and we have not spent a lot of money. Now, I've, I've, I'm going to get the elders, and we're going to try to get some 4K cameras, but that's probably not going to happen. But, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 what I'm saying is that with the cameras that we have, they're not really expensive. They're, you know, they're just little old video cameras, but to put it on YouTube, the quality, you're not going to get much better quality even if you buy, you know, a five or six thousand dollar camera. So I, I think we have done really good. That may go for a while, so we'll we'll see how that uh, that happens. So, and I appreciate those guys. They're constantly working. And here's the problem. There's always something, a glitch or something, and, and they have to spend a little bit of time problem solving. And, uh, but, you know, and it's something new all the time. It's either Facebook kicking us off or it's, you can't link YouTube to Facebook or, or vice versa. And I know I've said a lot of things, but what I'm saying is, those guys have uh, really done a great job, and I think we've got a great quality uh, video. And if you don't, you just get out there and look at them and see. Even our singing is really, really good So uh, because of the quality. All right. All right, so we're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16 on page number 16. And here's the Apostle Paul. He is in Philippi. And when we look at, uh, at Paul, and we, we've read this, and we've kind of gone a little bit slow. Maybe we need to go a little bit faster. Um, the idea is that here's Paul and Barnabas. They have gone into Philippi, and uh, uh, we see where uh, they enter into, uh, there's no synagogue, so they go down to the river. There's Lydia. Lydia, the Bible says uh, that God opens the heart of Lydia, meaning the fact is she's receptive to the gospel. She and her household obeys the gospel. Then Paul, as we look in, the, uh, in that book, is where uh, a young girl who has a spirit of divination. Now, what is, do you know what divination is? It was supernatural, and it also has to do with superstition, too, especially in the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, you have to remember that here's Paul. He's able and capable of performing miracles. So she is, she is following them and saying, here are the servants of the Most High God. And she knew that through this, this uh, spirit of divination. And remember that... Uh, Demon possession uh, affected people in different ways. Uh, when you look in the book of Luke and Mark, the, the man whose name is Legion that was possessed by many, many devils uh, or many, many demons, um, 
he had supernatural strength. They could not bind him. He was just out of his mind. Another occasion, a child would, would had one. He was cast himself down in the ground and, and cast himself in the water. And uh, sometimes they were deaf. Sometimes they were blind. Uh, sometimes they would speak. They would be in the synagogue when Jesus was there and confess that Jesus was the son of David, the most high God of the most high God. And so the, po the point is that this demon possession was supernatural. And it was, you have to remember why it was. That if when Paul cast this, this spirit of divination out of this young girl, it proves who he is, that he is an apostle of God. It proves that. Now she's confessing him as that, and it kind of irritated him after, what, two, three days? And so and when she, she, can't, he's, she is cast out, or the, the spirit is cast out of this young girl, then the Bible says that the, they have lost all their hope of gain. And so that's going to take them to be put into prison. So let me just go here and um, begin in Acts chapter 16 and look at a few verses, talk about them, and then we'll move on into chapter 17. Uh, also remember that this is, this is the church, the, the book of Philippi, or the book of Philippians is written to the church at Philippi, who began with Lydia and with the Philippian jailer. And, and that book is about the joy that is in Christ because they were worried that Paul being in prison, something would happen to them that they would, you know, they would be in despair because uh, Paul was, was out of the picture and they didn't know what they were going to do. So we get over to Acts chapter 16 and begin in verse number, probably 16. Now it happened as we were, as we went to pray. Now notice the word we, here is Luke is with them. That a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So she could somewhat read the future or foretell the future. You know, and, and sometimes uh, you, you have to remember that this probably was uh, miraculous. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, when it talked about the spirit of divination or talked about divinations, it was more superstition than anything else. In uh, Hosea chapter 4, verse 12, they had divinations by rods. They'd throw rods or sticks down and they'd look at those and, and they'd say, well, this, this bad thing's going to happen. Uh, it was done by arrows. They'd take a handful of arrows and throw them down. That's Ezekiel 21, 21. They would have uh, the spirit of divination by cups. They would take cups and, and look into it, the liquid, and come up with some concoction they would cut an animal open in the book of Ezekiel, also 21, 21, and look at the liver and uh, pro try to predict the future that way. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, it talked about the divinations of dreams. In fact, those individuals would be put to death because of practicing witchcraft, sorcery, and superstition. And so... Uh, but in this particular chapter, this young girl had the ability to see the future and to, to know things that other people did not know. And it's going to be to Paul's advantage because they had known this girl and she had, she had cast out or she had foretold the future. And so when Paul cast her out, it shows that Paul's has superiority to her. Now, Paul did a lot of miracles in his preaching and in his teaching uh, of the gospel. Verse 18, uh, verse 17, and this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So she knew. And you, you have to understand that even in the days of Jesus when he was in the synagogue, and there was a man that was possessed by demon, a demon, and more than one demon, because he leaps out of the audience into 
where Jesus is standing and says, have you come to torment us before our time? And he says that he is Jesus of Nazareth, uh, uh, the son of David of the Most High God, and uh, those words. So you have these witnesses, you have these demons who are revealing unto the, the people around them who Paul is, he's an apostle, He's been uh, sent by God to preach the gospel. Uh, you have him identifying who Jesus is. So even these de evil spirits had the ability to, to know who was from God. In other words, you had the Paul, the apostle, you had Jesus and such. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but the word here, the King James uses the word devils a lot, uh, but there's only one devil. There's only one diabolos, and that is Satan. There's only one. So when the King James translates this, it is actually the word demons, uh, and which means demonic or evil. And so... There's uh, been a lot of speculation as to who these, these demons are. Some say that they are fallen angels. Uh, some say uh, they are the evil spirits of men that have been uh, put into the Hadean realm. Uh, if you read Brother Guy in Woods, he leans more to this area because angels do not need a physical body to dwell in. Angels can appear such as ones on the plane of Mamre to, to Abraham, uh, to uh, other individuals, to Daniel. You had uh, Gabriel coming to Daniel and talking about Michael fi fighting. Yeah, Jacob wrestled with uh, an angel. So angels really do not need a physical body. But when you read about the, the demons that possessed uh, legion and they requested Jesus to go into the swine, into the pigs that ran off down into the water, it suggests that they had to have a body to dwell in to stay on earth. Because when they didn't have a body to stay in, then they would leave. Now, demon possession, the only time that we see the demon possession in the Bible is in the New Testament period. We do not read about it in the Old Testament. It was only in the New Testament. And Jews had a lot of superstitions concerning evil spirits. Number one, that the evil spirits dwelt in the, uh, the crumbs of the bread. And some say, well, that's why when the disciples, uh, Jesus fed the 5,000 and they took up 12 baskets of crumbs. Some say, well, it's because the Jews had this idea that the demons dwelt in, or, or would inhabit the bread crumbs. There's no, no evidence of that. It also said that demons would possess children that were outside after dark. A lot of this stuff uh, comes from superstition. But the, the demon possession that we f see in the New Testament are in the gospel accounts and then also in the book of Acts. There's Paul where he cast out this spirit of divination, meaning that, you know, each... Each demon possession was somewhat a little different. Uh, so most, I say most, many commentators believe that it was the evil spirits of men that had been put into the Hadean realm and God allowed them to come out onto the earth for one reason, to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Because the apostles have power over the demons. Jesus had power over the demons. You know, they would speak and Jesus was tell them don't speak and they couldn't talk. They literally could not talk. So don't think it's fallen angels. Uh, 
these at many times had supernatural strength. It affected people in different ways. Hearing, sight, uh, supernatural power. Uh, this girl had was able to foretell the future. And you have to remember, God allowed it. Satan and these demons cannot do anything unless God allows it. Even in the book of Revelation, along with that thought, when the church was being persecuted, God set the time limit on persecution. Satan doesn't, he can't persecute any longer than what God allows him. So the, the demon possession in the, in the Bible uh, is, in my opinion, also is these evil spirits only seen in the book of the Gospels and also in the book of Acts. And they're always, they're always being used in light of proving that whoever is a servant of God has power over them. So uh, that is, um, anybody got any question? Uh, there's a lot that can be written and some, uh, most of it, or I say most, some of it can be uh, speculative and so people are just kind of guessing. But you also have to remember, what did Peter and Jude also say about fallen angels? That they have been reserved for punishment. God has them in a holding place such as a hell-like condition until, in chains of darkness, until the day of judgment. We're not the only ones going to be judged on the day of judgment. Ain't these fallen angels are going to be judged too. So you'll see that this is uh, this in this particular passage dealing with the foretelling of the future and foretelling of who Paul is and also Silas and Luke. And, and yet what happens is when this spirit is cast out, uh, it shows Paul's power over the demonic world. Yes, they are spiritual beings. Imagine what they are as being in the flesh rather than the fact that right. those that are in chains, they don't, those are spiritual chains. Right. They're not literal chains. But God can bind them, can he? So here, you know, when God lets them out of the Hadean realm, of the, of the unseen realm, they have to go back there. Because, you know, on two, I know at least two occasions, they said to Jesus, have you come to torment us before our time, before they reach the judgment? So you, you understand that, that demon possession, and some say, well, demon possession is just epilepsy. No, it's not, because even epilepsy is mentioned along with these demonic spirits. So, first of all, they're not the same. Uh, and also God uses them proving that Jesus, being the Son of God, that God has power over, certainly over the underworld. Or right, any comment? But also you see that uh, it is the, it, the, it has, it, the spirit of divination or fortune-telling is coming from the Greek god Apollo or Pythion, which, which he was the god of everything, the god of music, the god of poetry, uh, the, the god of just about everything. Um, so just, uh, just keep in mind that this is the way the Greeks looked at it. Uh, so anyway, so she is, um, uh, verse 18, that Paul was greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So here was the casting out. Now, when it, when it means that very hour, it didn't take an hour for him to come out, but it meant that, that it was instantly, that it wasn't a week or two weeks or three weeks 
uh, later. And let me tell you something. Demon possession has fascinated our society, especially back in the 1970s. Uh, what was that movie that came out in the 70s? Well, Rosemary Baby, but The Exorcist is what I'm thinking about. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but we have been fascinated with that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, obviously they do. Yes. So, and I never thought of that, but that's that's true. Uh, it, it it is in the masculine form. Uh, so anyway, this demon came out, and the Bible says, verse nineteen, and when the, her master saw that their hope a prophet was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceeding trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So here are Roman men who have now drugged Paul and Silas before the, the marketplace. And this is where the magistrates were. People would go there and to, uh, you know, for any judicial things to make uh, judgments or, or whatever. And it says, And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be, be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they knew them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely, having received such a charge he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So, number one, here's the jailer. His life depended on keeping these, these prisoners safe. If these prisoners got away, his life was, would be taken. But also in this, they, they, these Romans looked at Paul and Silas and knew that they were Jews. But there's another problem. And what's that problem? It's not mentioned here. Paul and, and Silas, both are Roman citizens. Roman citizenship, you could not, you could not uh, punish a Roman citizen without a trial being found guilty. Uh, he could appeal even, even he could appeal even unto Caesar. He could go beyond the, the local magistrates. But also, something that I never thought of until reading this again, but do you think that Paul and Silas were silent about them being Roman citizens? I think they were not. I think they were telling them they were not, that they were Roman citizens, but these, these magistrates would not listen. The first thing they did, here's Jews, they're causing trouble, Let's beat them and then put them into prison. So that's going to cause them a lot of, of problems. But again, it is the opportunity that Paul uses, uses this opportunity to teach and to preach the gospel of Christ. They're thrown into not just the prison, but into the inner prison. That means that there's no windows, there's no light, they are bound by stocks and chains. The only way out is through the guard. Uh, they are put into this prison. And so, uh, <clears throat> verse 23, And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison. Having received such a charge, he put them in fastened them stock. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. You have just got the tar beat out of you, and you're sitting here praying singing what do you think they were praying about it's just my speculation that God would release them from prison because what happens at midnight he says and singing to hymns to God and the prisoners and the prisoners were listening here's Paul in prison you think he's teaching and preaching the gospel through songs through prayer and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the fountains of the prison 
were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and every cha everyone's chains were loose. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God answers prayers, but it's for the benefit of, here's the Philippian jailer. He's listening. Those prisoners are listening. They're singing, and they're praying. They're not saying, woe is me, why are we here? I knew we shouldn't have come to this place. They have beaten us and I'm hurting and everything else. They were rejoicing because they were suffering for Christ. And the end and the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. How can Paul have that much influence on these other prisoners? Exactly. These men are not going to escape. Paul, they're listening to Paul. So they, you know, when the first opportunity came, to, they could just hightail it out of there. Not none. <laughs> you had to get a go down there and get you some ever ready batteries and put it, put it in your torch and shine it in there. Um, and he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. You think Paul and Silas were preaching a sermon in their prison? You know, it, by the by their prayers, by their singing. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There is the theme of Acts. That's the question that is answered in the book of Acts. What must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 2, when the people on the day of Pentecost heard Peter preaching, and Peter says, With wicked hands you have crucified and slain the very Son of God. What was their question? <laughs> what must I do? What, many brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, we'll repent. What did, what did Paul say when he was on the road to Damascus and the Lord got his attention? What did he say? Lord, what would you have me to do? He said, well, you go into the city and it'll be told you what to do. That's right, must, M-U-S-T. That's in the imperative mode. He didn't tell him. Also, what must he feel? That's right. <laughs> we should preach that lesson, Ken. <laughs> but that's, he didn't tell him what he must feel. He told him what he must do. Three times in the Bible, and, this, and, this, and that, is, that is what is answered. That is what is answered in the book of Acts. It is the history of the church. It is about what a person must do to be saved. They didn't make up stuff. They're about it. They said they, they spoke to them in the word of the Lord. That's right. The, the, the message came from God. And then verse 31 says, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Does that mean all they had to do? Well, I believe Jesus. You know, I believe in Jesus. Is that what he's talking about? Believe on the Lord. Believe on his message. Believe on his gospel. Believe on his teaching. Everything that encompasses. You know, if you go to the doctor and say, I believe in my doctor, and he writes you out a prescription to take this medication so it keep you from having a heart attack. And you say, well, you know, he's a good doctor, but I ain't going to get this filled. I ain't going to take that. Do you believe in your doctor? Nah. You may think you believe in him. Don't you think that on the road to the Lord was speaking to Paul. He believed back then. He, was, he believed, I'm sure, right there. Yes. But he still had to go with Yeah, he still didn't know what to do, did he? Right. But he believed that Christ was from God. I think he did. In fact, he probably did even before. And I say this because of that, because of what Paul did in order to persecute these people, to persecute these Christians. 
he, you know, being in the law of Moses, he would, he would investigate, in my opinion, investigate what they believed so that he could take them and put them in prison. And when the, he didn't say, he, when he says, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus says, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute? Paul did not say, well, you know, I, I don't believe all that. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe. He said, what would you have me to do? I think he was on the verge of it anyway, my opinion. But, uh, that, that knocks that, all you have to do is believe in the hand right there. Yes, it does. And also, Paul went on in Damascus. He prayed three days and three nights. But he, that also does away with the sinner's prayer. Yes. Because he still, uh, and I still look right and be not, and yes. watch away. He prayed, but his sin was still yes. open after three days. Yes. So he yeah, had his sins washed away, right? Yeah. And and Revelation whatever five says we are washed in his blood. We are we have our sins washed in his blood. And that word washed is very unique word. It it means cleanse, but it also means loosed. That we are loosed from our sins. A figure because the cleansing is done spiritually. Yes. Yes, it is. But if you go back, and these people that talk about, you know, you don't have to be baptized, you don't have to be. You go back to the days of the Exodus. Before they left Egypt, what did they have to do? They had to wash. They had to cleanse. When they got into the wilderness, into the journey, and they were going to cross over Jordan, what did they have to do before they would cross over into the promised land. They had to wash. And it washing of the Old Testament was a regular thing. It was symbolic of cleansing, of washing away. So it's, you know, some of our religious friends simply say, well, you know, it's, that's just a figure. If you believe, then that washes your sins away. No, it doesn't. No, it, it doesn't do it. Yeah, go right ahead. Paul, right there, in that, that situation, and the Ethiopian community is two of the best examples that you have to, I mean, you can't dispute that. No. There's no way in that. See, here's one. It's hindered me to be baptized. They did not help him to with Jesus. So he had to tell Jesus that was teaching. Yes. Baptism to wash away his sister. He wouldn't even know that yes. to do that. And it says they go down into the water. Both you know, went down into the water. No. Yeah, and we use that example in in the in Guyana. They have been infected. They have us. They have been taught through the um, not the Catholic Church, but the uh, Ang Anglican Church, the Church of England, that all you had to do is be sprinkled. And we show them the passages that baptism was a burial, that we are buried with Christ. And so we take a little bit of dirt, and I said, now. So and so died. Your mother died two years ago. How did you bury her? Did you take a little dirt and sprinkle over her? And boy, they get it just like that. They do. They understand. No, you dig a hole and you put the body into the ground. You bury that body. So they understand. And go ahead. I was going to say that there's no example, no more, where you can pray your sins away. Uh, and every, everyone that's saved is immersed in baptism. Well, that's, that's plain and simple. The, 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 the idea of praying your sins away came about in the 16th century. 1,600 years after Christ left the earth, then that's when that doctrine came about. Acts and Well, and that's a long history because the the Catholic Church kept the Bible out of the hands of the common people. They kept the the Bible out of the hands of the common. That's why they translated it from the Greek to the Latin Vulgate because only the priests could read the Latin Vulgate of the Latin. 
But when uh, King James had it translated and then the Gutenberg printing press came about, that literally just opened, it just, it just put the hands, put the Bible into the hands of the common person. That's literally what it did. <clears throat> no, it did not. So, anyway. So, the point is that here's Paul and here's Silas. They're in the inner prison. They're singing and praying. They're not complaining. And when God sends the earthquake, it, it's going to, it's, a, it's another one of those miracles that brings the preacher and the sinner together. And so anyway, all right, so today is the ninth, ninth plus seven, that's the 15th, 16th. I guess so. We are going to start. We're going to start uh, chapter seventeen and verse one. We, if you want to talk about the, the Paul and Bart, Paul and Silas were beaten. They were Roman citizens, and anyway.
Well, it's good to see everybody out this evening for our midweek Bible class. We have 51 tonight and a good number. Still got some that are sick and uh, kids are sick, some are out of school, but keep uh, them in your prayers. Number 414 is our song of invitation. We'll be ready to sing that in just a moment. Uh, tonight, Brother Dallas is going to extend the invitation. We got him a brand new light. And the scripture is that Paul preached unto midnight. So, get ready. Here we go. Brother, brother. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity to do this and uh, got a brand new Bible, put the big print in it where I can read it. <laughs> Took the song it up. We turn it to song number five ninety seven. Must I go with empty handed? Just some things I wanna do before my time runs out. I'm getting up there. I'm pretty near the oldest man in the building tonight. I don't know that, but I'm pretty close. And uh, I don't have much time left, and just a few things I really want to get done before I leave this world. And I just want to reason with you a little bit tonight, and I'm going to try to make it as uh, quick as I can. But uh, I won't promise you anything. I told Sister Ann about 15 minutes, but <laughs> that's give or take. <laughs> but... I want to reason with you tonight about uh, this song, Must I Go in Empty Handed. If you studied and looked at it there real close, brethren, this, this, this song here will admonish you more than any song I have ever seen. I don't think there's another one that would come close to the way it would admonish you to do better. It points out things that we ought to be thinking about. If you're getting on down the road like I am and you can see the other side, you're close to home, you want to be ready to go. You, and you can't leave things undone. And certainly some have done that. And if they don't straighten up their lives, as this song would have them to do, they're going to lose their soul. They're going to, they're going to wind up in the wrong place after death. The two writers on this song, one of them lived to be 77, Mr. Luther and Mr. Stebbins, he lived to be 99. And I, I often wonder, I told Brother Sewell, I wonder what they had in mind, what possessed them to write this song. Uh, I, I would feel like that some little one or somebody that they were real close to was going astray. It maybe quit the church or whatever. It, it's very deep, and they had a purpose for writing it, to write any material like this. I want to read, read them and we'll just go over it verse by verse and just look at it and, and uh, uh, see what kind of reasoning we make out of it here. He says, Must I go in empty handed? Thus, my dear Redeemer, me. Not one day of service give him. Lay no trophy at his feet. Now, that's a sad situation right there when you just first look at it. No trophy for the Lord? Must I go? Oh, yes, you don't go because Hebrews 9, 27 tells us all we're going to die. We have an appointment with death. We're going to go, but we don't have to go empty-handed. We can do something about that. And so certainly we want to try to be ready to do what we can at that time. And uh, I, I would think that whoever they're writing about is probably a member of the church. Now look at this. It's thus my dear Redeemer, me. Now won't that be pitiful to meet the Lord you're a child of God, have been a child of his, you've been baptized, you've been added to the church, and the Lord has washed your sins away, and then you quit the church. You're no longer faithful. Or you just don't do any work. 
You can't be defended on to do any work of the church. You're just going to sit down and wait. You can't do that, brethren. That won't work. Not with God. He expects us to be workers. So certainly, brethren, we, we don't have to go very empty-handed. God has a remedy for that. We need to be doing work. We need to get out here trying to preach to the lost, trying to help somebody study the Bible if they can obey and be baptized and add to the Lord's church. There's a lot of work we can be doing. We don't have to go empty-handed. And look at this. Not one day of service give him. In other words, nothing. In other words, we've done nothing. Not one day. Why? I just wonder about anybody's faith when you when you come to a position like that. What sort of faith do they have or supposedly you think they have when they do nothing? The Lord will judge that, I know, but we need to try to help. And what I want to do tonight is, is, is just take these song, this song and try to encourage you to be ready to meet the Lord when he calls you. Because the song's going to talk about that too. We're going to call, get called, brother. Hebrews 9. It just, it's just there. We won't get around it. 9.27. We all have that appointment with death. If you're as old as I am, it's not very far down the road. And I'll have to meet it, whether I want to go or not. You look back in the judgment that I think we were made and put into this world to be here forever until sin come in. And that destroyed the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect until the devil got in there and brought sin. And now we have to answer the call of death. It's a sad, it's a final thing, it's hard, it's cold, and we don't want to do it. We don't know what is over on that other side. We live here and we're familiar with it. We don't want to go into some place we haven't been before, but we go. Death's going to take us right over there. Not one day of service. Now, what kind of a report is that for someone supposed to be a Christian? Remember the Lord's church. And we're doing nothing. Lay no trophy at his feet. We don't even have a, a friend or a neighbor or some kin folks that we've helped baptize to save them from losing their soul. Get them added to the Lord's church. Be an example to them, a friend and someone they can trust to help them. Not, not anything to give the Lord. He don't want a pocket full of money. He doesn't need that. He don't want an automobile. He don't want your bank account. He doesn't need it. He wants you to win souls. That's what he wants. He wants you to be a worker out here helping somebody. And so certainly there's plenty we can do. We're, we're wrapped up with all kind of communication equipment right now that we never, I never even dreamed I'd ever see this in this life. I had never seen the television until it was, I was almost out of high school. And what little I saw, they were trying to bring it in from Dothan now by about 60 miles. Maybe Montgomery, that's about another 60 miles. It didn't look too good when it got to Brandon. You ever seen so much static in all your life and a test pattern most of the time? <laughs> and it looked like a snowstorm. That's about what we were looking at. We were straining trying to see something, you know. Couldn't see it. Brethren, we, we can do better than that. We've got to do better than that or we're going to lose our soul. We've got to get back to doing personal work and trying to encourage each of us to do better. If it's just one thing that you can pick up and start doing better tomorrow, do it. If it's just calling a friend and trying to encourage them. If it's trying to see if a brother needs some help or one of the sisters needs some help because she's sick, go by and see what you can do. Call and see if there's anything you can do. It don't take much. We can be busy. 
encouraging one another. And we better do it while we got time. All right, let's, let's look at it, verse 1. Let's read verse 2. Oh, the years in sinning wasted. Could I but recall them now? I would give them to my Savior. To his will I gladly bow. Oh, the years in sin and wasted. And now just think back, each one of you. you know, just keep it to yourself. How many years have you let slip away that you could have been serving the Lord? I was 38 when I obeyed the gospel. I figured at least 20 I could have been serving the Lord that I have wasted. The Apostle Paul never did get over the many years he spent out there persecuting the Lord's church and he tried to make up for it. And I mean, he suffered. But he went out there and did his best with all his preaching and the suffering he had to go through. He stayed right in there and he worked trying to make up, as I call it, for lost time. Hard to do, isn't it? Wasted. It's of no good. It's in vain. Out there, I, I know I missed 20 years that I could have been serving the Lord. But it's, it's gone. I can't do anything about it. I can't call it back. Could I but recall them now? No, you can't recall time. You can go back in memory, make some changes, but you can't call them days back. The time is gone. And by the way, that's the most important and the most precious thing you have got tonight is your time. And I don't know how much of it you've got. You don't know either. When you give a man all your time, he's giving you the most valuable thing you got. So time is precious. And we don't have an answer to how much of it we've got. The Lord handles that himself. And when he calls, we'll answer. Could I but recall them now? No, you can't call that time back. It's gone. You can't call a loved one back. They're gone. Nothing you can do about that. You can call them members back. That's it. I would give them to my Savior. Too late. You can't give him anything you can't call back. You've let it get away. You've wasted your time. You've let it slip away. You need to redeem it. Use it in the Lord's service. To his will, I'd gladly bow. Now you can do that if you need to do that. Try to do God's will. Get back in the light with Jesus and walk with him every day. That his blood will continue to cleanse you from your sin. And if we're confessing to God the Father, 1 John 1 and 9, he'll forgive us if we'll confess our sins to him. There's a remedy there, brethren. We can get back and start doing the work of God if we hadn't been doing it. I'm just trying to exhort you tonight. That's what I'm trying to do. To do better, do more while you got time in this life because your time is running out. I don't have to look far because I can see the door almost the other, the other end. I'm way closer to the other end of life than I am to the beginning. You can bow. You can do it gladly. You can repent and get back in the light with Jesus. Walk with him. And his blood will wash away your sins every day. Keep you clean. And the Heavenly Father will forgive you. He loves you. So certainly, Revelation 2 and 10 says he's faithful unto death and we don't even give him a day, have nothing to give him, empty hand. You look, you look at back at uh, these folks that have been faithful and true to him, served him all of these years. We've got members of the church here that can remember some of the old timers, how faithful and true they were here at ever service. Can you do that? We need to be here at ever service to admonish one another, to edify one another, to build up one another in the service of the Lord. We need to be doing that. Encourage one another. Because if they come in, brethren, it'll be too late. Verse 3. 
O ye saints, arouse, be earnest. Up and work while yet is day. Ere the night of death. Now that's a picture of death right there. I've never particularly noticed. But in this song it says, Ere the night of death. If you talk about something that's final, just run up on death. Be there with a loved one when they pass from this life. It's over. They can't talk to you anymore. You can't talk to them. It's just like night coming out there when you can't work. Strive for souls while still you may. There you are. There's work to do. Try to win souls while you're in, the, in the, this world. You're walking in the light. Because when that darkness sets in, brother, we can't work every day. There's just no way to do it. So we need to do it while it's day. We need to do it while we have the strength to get out here and do it. And if you get as old as I am, your eyesight gets bad. Pretty much you can't even drive around town at night because you can't see good. You've got to avoid a lot of that night driving and things like that. You have to make changes in your life and keep getting the work done as best you can. I'm thankful for the changes that have been made since I last time up here. I can see. Uh, got a big print Bible that Brother Joel bought me. I mean, it's a knife. And I can read it. And so certainly, and to look at this beautiful song. And uh, if you sing this thing real slow, I mean, it will really bear down on you if you want to listen to it and really begin to get the feeling of it. There's some feeling in this song. Sing it slow. Really put the feeling in it. And you'll get the message out of it. You got to work while it's daylight, brother. While you have the opportunity, you have the help, and what have you. You can't wait for the old folks to do this. Their time has done past where they can do a lot of this work. You young people have got to start doing it. And today would be the day. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. Old folks can't keep carrying the load. They can't hold up to it. They'll do what they can, but they hinder. But it's nice to have them around for advice and example of how we all ought to help and treat one another. You just take and look at the things that we could be doing. Helping one another. We need to exhort one another. We need to be faithful in our attendance. And there's a lot of people, what I want, I want to talk to you about that. I think this is some of the problem with the people we're having that this song was wrote to or wrote about. Yeah, I try to analyze one of them and just kind of get an idea why they wrote it. And uh, it, I get an idea all right. It might not be the right one. But I try to find out why, what possessed them to write it. And, and that's exactly what I want to do there. Hebrews 9, 27, death is going to overtake it. So let me just do this. Let's just look at this as just uh, exhorting, try to exhort you. Be faithful in your attendance. Everybody in this congregation is watching you. They know whether you're here or not. If you're not here, how are you going to exhort them and encourage them? And when we do, when we're all here, we encourage one another, we become strong. We're, we're more in desirable to get out here and do the Lord's work. But if I'm sitting at home, I can't encourage you. I can't impress you with faithfulness and cause you to want to be more like me. You don't want to be like me if I'm sitting at home and ought to be down here to serve the church. And the Lord is here in attendance. And so certainly, I want to come meet the Lord. And surely I want to partake of the Lord's Supper after all that he has done for me and for everybody else. Died on the cross of Calvary for my sins. Poured out his blood that I could be washed clean. 
and it'll be added to his church as a child of God. Look what the Lord has done for us. Surely we want to come on Sunday and be here with him. Partake of the Lord's Supper. Petition him in prayer. Give a Bible meaning. Raise our voice in songs of praise to him. And admonish one another. Encourage one another. Brother, it's getting late. It's getting late for some of us. We can preach. We can teach. We can be ready on every good work that we can find to do in the church. Don't just pass it by and wait for somebody else to do it. You see, it needs to be done. Do it. You're working for the Lord. You're his servant. Do it. Look at our bulletin text. A beautiful encouragement that text is. He exhorts us to do good. You can give a cup of cold water in one of the disciples' name, Matthew 10 and 42, and that's a blessing for you and for them. God will bless you for it. You say, I don't, I can't do anything. Yeah, you can. Just, the Lord has got it down to where just a cup of cold water. He'll see that. He'll give you credit for it. It'll be on your account when the books are open. He made it so easy for us. We, we, we're right here in, in, in a fine building, comfortable, and we're here together encouraging one another. I mean, what, what, what else could we want? We need to be doing everything we can, brethren, to the Lord, working for the Lord. We need to be doing personal work. One or two of us need to get together. If, if one can't see how to drive at night, maybe you can go with somebody that can. And maybe you're young and, and you and your wife can go and visit some of the older folks and encourage them and see if you can do something around the house for them. There's work to be done, brethren. We need to encourage one another or we're not going to make it. If you want to be a friend or you want friends, you've got to be one. We know that that's just common sense. Your brethren are watching you to see how faithful you are. Your husband or your wife, whatever the case might be, they're watching you to see if you're going to quit. Oh, he won't last long. He, he, you know, he was this, that, and the other. He, he, he's, been, he's gone down to the church down there, but it won't last long. He'll be back last like he was. So you won't get any encouragement there for a while. But they're watching you, trying to find out where you're going to mess up, as we call it. Set that good example, brother. Be like the Apostle Paul. Don't be deterred because you wasn't what you ought to have been several years ago, but you've changed. You've obeyed the gospel, and the Lord has washed your sins away. Now, this is the thing about it. And then we get tired of doing anything for the Lord, so we quit. Well, he's done washed all our old sins away. We owe him a debt. He don't even remember them anymore. We can't treat him like that. That's just like going in here and borrowing money from the banker and then refuse to pay the loan back. Won't work. You're dealing with the Lord. He keeps the books, the book of life. Your children are watching you. Every move you make. How's daddy doing? Is he still faithful? But after about five, six, seven, eight, ten years, they'll begin to believe you're faithful if you're here each Lord's day unless you're sick. They'll begin to see that you have changed. I know your family is probably the one that's going to be the hardest on you of anybody out there. Your neighbors and friends will treat you a lot better when it comes to obeying the gospel and working for the Lord. You'll get more cooperation from them. Children, they followed you. Where are they following you? Where was the rich man's brothers following him in Luke 16? Right down there in torment where he was. He wanted Lazarus to be sent back to talk to his brethren. They were on their way right there in torment where he was. Couldn't be arranged. You can't call back. 
The Lord said they got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear thee. And that settled it. No way around that. Grandchildren. Now, let me tell you something. Them grandchildren are precious. Uh, if we'd have got them first, we never would have got the first ones. <laughs> we would have sent them back. But them little grandchildren are something else, and they're precious. And they're watching us. They love Grandpa and Grandma, and that is the way it ought to be. What would you do without your granny or your granddad or your papa, whatever what you want to, whatever how you call them? Some of them papa, some of them grandpa, granny, some of them mama. They, they set great store in the grandparents, and that's right they where it ought to be. You need to teach them and lead them and be there for them when they need your help. I used to think when I got here, just get the granny and she could fix it. She knows how to doctor it and take care of you, just anything that you need to get the granny. She'd handle it. I still think that. Your friends, they're watching you. The old dad, as he goes down to the church of Christ, you're right, he's faithful and they're watching you. They don't see me laying around the house on Sunday unless I'm sick in the bed. I'm, I'm down here if I can an hour before service time in case I can straighten up something that might be amiss in the building. I enjoy. I like to work. I get sick at the wall around about three days. I get so tired of doing nothing, I'm just miserable. I can't stand it. I don't even like holidays go two or three days in a row where I can't get out and do some work to do something. I don't like to be lazy. What about your family members? Kin folks? Are they watching you? They sure are. After a while, they'll tell everybody you're a Christian when they finally believe it. And they see what you've been doing. That you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then finally, the Lord's watching you. He's keeping up with you. He knows where you're here or not on Sunday, on Wednesday night, during gospel meetings, whatever. Brother, I'm just trying to exhort you to do more than you've been doing. Add something to your daily routine. Get involved. Do what you can. The Lord's watching you. If it's just a cup of cold water, we're beating up in all the people. Just a cup of cold water. He's made it so easy. We won't have, a, as I say, a leg to stand on when we meet him in the day of judgment and we hadn't been doing anything. What are we going to tell you? Who can come in there and intercede for you when it's too late? So you can't do anything after death. That's it. It's the end of the road for me and you. We come into this life as a little old baby. We have nothing to do with getting in here. And we're going through this life as a pilgrim or a stranger. We're just traveling through the death door. And we can't stop that either. We're going through it. Now, what are we going to do in between? Are we going to serve the Lord or wait too late? Can't wait too late, brother. Can't recall that time again. You can't call her back 20, 30 years. It's too late. So, if you're empty handed, just check it tonight and see if you are. Do something about it. And make a correction if you need to in your life. To get your course straight again. Get back, get back to Jesus. Get back in that light with him. The psalmist in 139 says, Get in the way everlasting and be found walking there when death overtakes you. And you'll be on the way to heaven. For you're walking in the light with Jesus. The way everlasting. That's the only one to walk in. If you're walking somewhere else, you, you're wasting your time. And it won't be anything you're going to receive in that great day. If you have a problem, have something that's bothering you in this private, take care of it in private. 
get things right with God and be ready to meet him when he calls. It's going to come like a thief in the night, brother. You may not be ready. You don't have time to prepare after the call comes. Too late. If it's of a public nature and it's known all over town and you're a member of the church and you want to make things right, come down when we sing the invitation hymn and we'll help you in any way that we can. We'll make prayer for you on your behalf. Be glad to do it. Welcome you back. And do anything we can to help you. You've heard the word tonight, Romans 10, 17. Brother Joe done a fine job in Bible class. Hebrews 11 and 6, we need to believe, have belief in faith. It's impossible to please God if we don't believe in him, have faith in his word. And then Luke 13, 3 and 5, we need to repent. Are we going to perish? The writer Luke said. Matthew 10, 32, we need to confess Christ before men and he'll confess us before his Father in heaven. Now that's what we want to hear. The Lord say, Father, he's mine. She's mine. That all has to be done. In Acts 2.38, be baptized for the remission of our sins. If you've never put on Christ, come and do that tonight, and we'll help you any way that we can. Won't you come while we stand and stand? Why can't you the way we Ready? like to again welcome everybody to our midweek Bible study, um, especially the visitors we have. Visitors, if we ask if it's your first time visiting with us, please fill out a visitor's card. They're located on the pew in front of you. You can just leave them on the pew when you leave. We have a record of your attendance. Our next worship times will be Sunday at 9 a.m. for Bible class, 10 a.m. for worship, and then again at 6 p.m. that evening for worship. You can be with us. It would be much appreciated and be, be glad to have you. I'd like to go over our list of sick, those that we need to remember our prayers. Remember, this is an abbreviated list. Please see the bulletin for a complete list of names. Rhonda Burnett, Sue Wheeler, Nancy Marshall, Vaughn and Marshall and Underwood, Bill Wright and Bonnie Wright, Scott Shifford, Jerry and Della Hill, Travis Dean is recovering from surgery at home. Please, no visitors at this time. Amanda Underwood is recovering from surgery. She is scheduled for another surgery on December 29th. And Cheryl Brittle is undergoing more tests. Also, we are continuing to update the church directory. So if you need any of your information updated, please write them down and give them to Brother Joel. And if you would like your photos updated, let Brother Joel know. Some of us probably don't want our photos updated, but some of us probably need to get them updated. Okay, so we're taking some Sunday, so if you want them updated Sunday, dress your best for you can have a good photo. Um, if preparing the communion is a work you would like to participate in, the sign-up list is in the foyer for 2023, so please make sure you see that and sign up if you can help with that. There's no birthdays this week, but we would like to wish a happy anniversary to Kenneth and June Rourke today on the 9th, so happy anniversary. Our pantry item for the week is box stuffing mix. And one other thing I'd like to add is please just remember to pray for the people in Florida that are about to get by another storm just coming from the other direction. So they're having a rough year. That's all the announcements.
<clears throat> our closing song is 22. We'll sing the first and the last verse of that song. And after we've done that, uh, Brother Scott Shifford will lead us in prayer. Allow me to thank Brother Dallas for uh, the advice that he gave us from God's holy word about being busy in the work of the Lord. I'm not going to preach another sermon because you've heard a, a great one from him. But there's an adjunct to that, and there's probably there's several others as well. One is the song that you read about in uh, 740, uh, To the Work, written by a, a woman that lived to be 95 years old. And, and her name just flew away from me. But you can turn over and you can see who she was. It's, it's great. You know, in Galatians 6.10 tells us all we need to know. Therefore, as you have opportunity, brethren, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. So there's always opportunity for us to do good, even to those that we may not particularly care for. So that's, that's one of the great things that we have to be able to adjust our minds to, is to do good unto all men. We'll uh, invite you to stand as we sing these last, uh, this last song with these two verses. Be with me, Lord. Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. Heavenly gracious, loving Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we know that it was good that we were here this day. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be here at the next appointed time. Father, be with us and help us to find our niche. Find that little thing that we can do. And help us to do it very well. Father, be with us. Help us to be strong physically, mentally, and most of all spiritually that we may be able to defeat Satan and overcome this world. Be with us throughout this week. Help us be pleasing in thy sight all the things that we say and do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.